back in the late 90s, we had a lecture here, an event uh, called The End of Science. John Horgan wrote a book called The End of Science. And uh, well, Caltech is still here. They're still doing science here. So <laughs> apparently, it, it didn't end. <laughs> it's one of those sort of clickbait type, uh, you know, you should check out, out, out this claim. Uh, this subject is not about that. In fact, it's just the, uh, kind of the opposite of that. That, uh, in fact, there may be limits out there that we don't know what they are. And, and, and these these are the great questions on the edges of science, and philosophy, physics, and metaphysics, and the meaning of life, and all that. And I'm thrilled that we have uh, Marcelo Gleiser with his book, The Island of Knowledge: The Limits of Science and the Search for Meaning. He's a the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth. College, and he's the author of three previous books, The Dancing Universe, The Prophet and the Astronomer, and A Tear at the Edge of Creation. That's a great title. I really like that. I've been reading this book this weekend, and it's really quite good, dealing with the greatest questions that we can ask. Uh, and so after the talk, we'll do some Q&A, and then you can get your books and get them signed here. Uh, and so uh, please help me welcome Dr. Marcella Gleiser. Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm actually quite impressed that you're all here. I was a little concerned because, you know, yesterday Steve Pinker gave his lecture and I said, are these skeptics that skeptical that they'll come <laughs> twice, you know, one day after another? And so I'm really glad you did. Whew. Excellent. <laughs> you know, um, so, uh, and I also thank Michael for inviting me. You know, it's the first time I do this um, and it's, it's a real pleasure to, to share this with you. So you're right, this is the anti-John Horgan lecture, right? I mean, so the, it is not about the end of science, it's about endless science. So it's exactly the opposite idea, right? And, um, and as I want to persuade you that, maybe I don't need to, but I'll <coughs> illustrate it to you, that uh, knowledge really is a pursuit that can only branch out. It can never really reach a final answer to anything, and that has a lot to say about the way we think of, of nature and, and the way we are as humans, okay? So let me set the tone with a quote from the big man himself, right? And what Einstein said there is, what I see in nature is a magnificent structure that we can comprehend only very imperfectly, and that must fill a thinking person with a feeling of humility, right? And it's interesting that he says that because from his perspective, he really wanted to understand everything, or he believed it was possible to understand everything, right? So he had this realist, uh, realist view of science where he would think that um, there is an explanation, a rational explanation to everything that exists, right? That I, and we can get to it, right? And, and a lot of his angst with quantum physics was precisely that the development of quantum physics, which is the physics that studies the world of the very small atoms and molecules and subatomic particles, was kind of saying, sorry, Einstein, that's not quite the way things are. So there was a real clash of worldviews, you know, between what he believed nature should be like. Nature had to be reasonable, right? The famous God doesn't play dice thing. And the fact that it didn't seem to be that reasonable, that it was there were questions about the nature of reality that were simply beyond our comprehension, right? And that, of course, rubs right against the goal of science, right? Because after all, what do we want to do? We want to explain everything we, want, we can, right? That's the idea, right? We want to know as much as we can about reality, right? And um, it turns out that when you start thinking about certain questions, which I'll go on in, in some detail here, um, you don't really even know what reality means. Right? And you have to really qualify what you're talking about when you talk about the nature of reality. You know, reality is a real loaded word. So, so let's uh, move on. And um, they have another one of Einstein's quotes, which I love, which it says that the fairest thing we can experience is the mysterious. Right? It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. He who does not know it and can no longer wonder is as good as dead. So basically he's saying, wake up people if you don't get really excited about what we don't know, the so-called mysterious, then don't even bother living, right? It's not fun. I mean, life is about curiosity, is about trying to figure things out, so to speak, right? So that's what he meant there, right? And, and here we are, right? So we have this picture of, of the fish in a bowl, 
right? And, and what it's trying to symbolize is essentially that are we the fish in the bowl, right? Are we the fish that we can see around our surroundings and then, you know, through the glass, they sort of diffuse image that there is something out there, right? So are we the fish or are we the guy that took the picture of the fish, you know, that is outside, you know, really happy and, hey, look, the world is out there. I can see the sunset, you know, and maybe I can see a lot of different things and, and has this sort of notion that what you capture of reality is all there is of reality, right? And so you say, yep, that's reality. Really? You know, is this really what reality is about, right? So it turns out that it is not, right? I mean, that we humans, as we see things, right, we see things in a very limited way, right? And things that we think we understand about the world, we quite, we don't. And so what we try to do is, wait, let's construct a way of thinking based on what we can capture of reality. So the way you start with that is, hey, I can see this guy talking and I can hear him and I'm sitting down and I can feel the heat. And so you have your, four, your five senses. They are, in a sense, your antennas to the world, right? I mean, they are the things that are capturing information about what's going on outside. And there is this amazing thing that happens that all this information is then captured and integrated into your brain, right? And somehow through this in integration process that we don't quite understand, you say, yep, that's reality. I am here. This is what I can sense of the world, right? And, and you say, yeah, that is a small fraction of reality, right? Right now, there's lots of stuff. A lot of stuff is happening around us that we have absolutely no clue. Right? And that does not mean that they are not real. It just means that we cannot perceive it. Right? So examples. You have all the FM and AM radio stations of Pasadena you know, beaming a lot of electromagnetic waves through this room right now. Same with cell phones. Right? And the same with uh, the dust particles that you cannot see. And getting a little more eccentric, right now the sun is burning all the hydrogen and transforming it into helium. And as it does so, it creates all sorts of particles, including neutrinos. And these neutrinos, they travel almost at the speed of light, and they get to you. And at every second, there are about one trillion, which is a ridiculous number, right? One trillion neutrinos per second going through you, and you have no clue this is happening, right? <laughs> And there are all these radioactive particles because there is nature, natural radioactivity coming from the underground, and they are going through us right now as well, and we don't know. That does not mean they're not real. And we're not even talking about all the bacteria and all that kind of stuff, right, that is, is happening, and you know, we're all worried about some of them right now again. So, so the point here is that science, what it does is that it amplifies the view of reality, right? I mean, what it's doing is, okay, us, we have a very uh, limited way of looking at reality, but hey, we have our brains, and our brains are awesome, and we can actually amplify that through our instruments, right? And it turns out, though, that the way you look at the world is very much the way we humans look at the world, right? And when people talk about what is truth, Right? And I don't want to get too heavy here on us, but we can later on. You know, what is the nature of truth? You have to say, what do you mean by truth? Do you mean truth in an absolute sense, or in a sense that this is the way we conceive of reality, and this is the truth for us? Meaning, if you have an alien species that is also intelligent out there, will they think of reality in the same way that we do or not? Right? And so, Heisenberg, who was one of the big architects of quantum physics, made a statement which I love, which is this. You know, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. So the way we humans look at things and ask questions about things, in a sense, defines the way we see things. Right? So you can't really necessarily talk about things like absolute reality or absolute truth. You know, those statements about absolutes are very dangerous. There is one of my intellectual heroes 
is, um, is a fellow called Isaiah Berlin. Okay, so he was a great essayist from Oxford. And uh, he would say that any statement that starts with an absolute, you know, this is it, or this is the end of science, you know, like decreed, dogmatic, does not make any sense. That you can only make st statements with relative values, you know. So whenever you make a statement which is an absolute statement, you're losing immediately because you can't compare it to anything else, right? So it is very dangerous to make final absolute statements. And that includes some statements that are made in physics, which is where I come from, right? So I'm a theoretical physicist. I work in cosmology and high energy physics. So I deal with the Big Bang and black holes, that kind of small questions that we cosmologists <laughs> deal with, right? You know, for us, like 10 million years is a good, good sort of average, you know, accuracy when we're measuring something. But we're asking these questions, you know, and in a sense, cosmology is a, is a very particular part of science because it touches on questions which are not just scientific, right? I mean, you're talking about the origin of the world and the origin of matter, you know, and the future of the universe, you know. You know these questions are also asked by things that happened before science, like religion, right? That have been around. So people have had this curiosity about beginnings and endings since the beginning of history, as far as we understand, right? And you can boil that to something which transcends the science and religion, which is really about we humans have an urge to know. And there was this philosopher from the 18th century, 17th century, called Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle, his name was. And the same year that Newton published his Principia, 1686, he published this amazing book called a Dialogue or Discourse on the Plurality of Worlds. So 1686, this French philosopher was interested in there are other worlds out there. Is there life in these worlds or not, right? And the interesting thing about this book is that it was framed as a dialogue, sort of a platonic influence where the philosopher himself is taking walks at night with a marquise, a woman, intelligent woman as a protagonist in the 17th century, which is extremely rare, right? And um, she actually basically knocks him down all the time, which is, which, which is wonderful. But what he says is, we have an urge to know, and he summarizes this tension between wanting to know and not knowing everything in the following statement, which I love, right? It is, all philosophy is based on two things only, curiosity and poor eyesight. And that's just right on, right? Because we want to know more and more and more. Of course, that's the nature of, of our humanity. On the other hand, we can't, right? We, we just see things like the fish through the bowl, right? We can't see everything. And so from this comes the tension, but from this comes the creativity as well. So what we are trying to do is satisfy our curiosity by improving our eyesight. And science is very much an effort to do that. Right? So we're all here celebrating that point. However, the question then becomes, how much of it can you actually know, and how much of it are we being fooled? Right? And there was a guy there a long time ago thought about this, and his name was Plato. Right? And Plato, in the book seven of the Republic, he wrote an allegory that I'm sure some of you know called the Allegory of the Cave. Right? And for those of you who do not know, basically the idea is the following. Let's imagine that we are in a cave right now, okay? And you're all slaves, That's, he's talking about that. So you're all slaves and you've been chained since you were born in such a way that you can only look forward, okay? So you're born looking forward, it's an allegory, and all you can see is the wall, the cave, uh, the wall in front of you, okay? And whatever you call reality is what you see on that wall. So your construction of reality is based on what you can see on that wall, right? And Plato had different reasons, many reasons for, for coming up with the allegory, but one of them is, are your senses telling you the truth, okay, capital T, or are you being just fooled, right? And his point in his allegory is that you're totally being fooled, okay, because he, the, the slaves didn't know that behind them there was this big fire and there were some philosophers 
right in front of the fire, carrying some statues and some objects. And so the fire, the light of the fire, would cast shadows on the wall. And what the slaves thought was real was just the shadows from these objects. And they did not correspond to the objects at all. So if you believe that what you think of reality is based on our perception of reality, you're doomed to be fooled, right? That if you really want to know reality, and this is Plato's argument, you have to go to the realm of the mind, the pure ideas, okay? So he would say, for example, the only perfect circle is the circle you imagine, is the idea of the circle. So if, if I tell you, imagine a circle, right? All of you immediately imagine a circle in your heads. And what Plato would say is that that is the only perfect circle that exists. If I tell you, print or draw a circle, that real, the, the real representation of the circle, that is the stuff that goes from the idea to the paper, is never perfect. You can have your super duper printer. It's never going to be perfect. So that was his idea. of, And that from there sort of notion came this whole notion that Platonism, the idea that truth is in mathematics, and if you really understand permanent truth, you cannot trust what you see. You have to trust this realm of ideas. Okay, so that's sort of the notion. So I have here a cartoon to explore a little bit this. It's um, where Neo from The Matrix right, can <laughs> visits Plato's cave. Okay, so here he comes. So um, I don't know if I have a point. I'll just come over here. So, Here's Neo, right, with his submachine gun there. And, uh, and you see the slaves, right? And they're looking at a picture of a unicorn doing something he shouldn't be doing in public, right, <laughs> essentially, right? It's kind of obnoxious. And what the slaves don't know is that there is a very naughty philosopher back there, you know, just doing hand signs, like doing little puppets, right? And, and the slaves, wow, unicorns exist, and they poop just like us, you know? And, and it's just a bunch of signals from this end. And Neo is saying, you know, this is now the Matrix idea, right? It is prophesied that one day a chosen one among us will break free of this world and reveal to us the true nature of reality, right? And he's like, I don't think so. Right, meaning, what the heck is the true nature of reality anyways, right? So what there is is what we can make out of it. You know, that's the point, right? So just to kind of organize this, uh, this argument, I'm going to break it down into three parts, okay? Which is exactly how also the book is structured. First, cosmic big, big things like universe and what is reality at that level, the material reality, you know, stuff and the cognitive reality, meaning the mind, the brain, what does it mean? So the first thing, we have absolutely great reasons to celebrate science, right? Because what we are doing is we are creating ways of amplifying our perception of the world, right? And that's why I call these scientific instruments, I call them reality amplifiers, because that's essentially what they're doing, right? And I have a bunch of them here. In particular, one of my favorites of all time, which is the Hubble Space Telescope, right? That completely changed the way we think about the universe and objects in it. I'll soon show a picture of it. And then on the bottom right, that is a picture of the insides of the Atlas detector at CERN, right? The Large Hadron Collider where the Higgs boson was discovered, right? Um, so, and I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little person here, right? Okay. So this thing is about a four-story building in, in height, and it has more steel than the Eiffel Tower. Right? And it's kind of funny right, that you have such an enormous thing to measure the smallest little bits of stuff that exists, which is really telling you something about the technologies that we are using to study subatomic particles that are being pushed to the limit. Right? That is sort of like we need some new idea to kind of decrease the size of these machines. But that's another story. So the point here of these instruments, that they're all fabulous and they all change our worldview in many ways, right? Oh, cool. Um, but every instrument has a limit. So let me f talk about the microscope so I know I'm, I'm not too physics oriented all the time, right? But that's a mi microscope in the context of biology, right? So the microscope was discovered, excuse me, was invented, there's a very big difference between these two words. You have to be very, especially in this lecture here. It was invented in the late 1600s, right? And it completely changed the way people looked at life, 
right? Because before the microscope, life was stuff that people could see that was alive, right? I mean, they were like living things. And with the microscope, people would look at a drop of water and say, wow, there's all these little invisible living things in there that we didn't even know about, right? So suddenly, a new instrument created a new worldview and a revolution in the way we understand the nature of life. And that has happened many, many, many times in the history of science. You know, Freeman Dyson, who is one of the people I really like in many ways, although he's been very controversial in some topics like climate change, etc. But he says that you can tell the history of science by the history of instruments that changed the way people looked at the world, right? And I think that's a very pragmatic, interesting way of thinking about that, especially coming from a theoretical physicist. But his point is very well taken, that these machines do change the way we picture reality. However, they are also myopic, meaning every instrument has a limitation, right? Every instrument has a range of precision, which tells you something very interesting about how we probe things which go beyond our perception, which is we can only see reality up to a certain point. You can improve technology. We have been improving technology, and we have seen more and more things and more and more precisely. However, you never have the complete clear vision. There is no such thing as a complete clear vision. There is no such thing as a perfectly precise measurement. Every measurement we make in science is with error bars, which have to do with the errors that come from the instruments themselves and also with systematic errors that have to do with the way we kind of chain up all the logic that goes from making a measurement and inter interpreting that. So, and this is a crucial point, right? That everything that we do in science has to have a little caution, you know, like sub, like little small, like eight font words, like within the precision of this instrument, right? And that is very, very important. And that's something that we're going to talk about uh, later on. So even though we're incredibly creative, we have to keep in mind this fundamental limitation of our tools and what that implies to when we talk about reality and what we can see of the universe. So talking about that, um, let's go cosmic a little bit now. Um, and I want to just contrast three different worldviews just to show you because the subtext of this, of this whole um, argument that I'm making here is that science is a narrative that we construct to describe what we can see of the world. And given that what we can see of the world changes because of the nature of our instruments and also because of the nature of our mathematics and our ideas theoretically, that narrative changes in time. And so what you think is true at one point will not be true anymore at another point. That's why I was saying that when we talk about truth, you have to be very careful when describing science, which doesn't mean that Newton's second law is not going to work. Of course it's going to work. You know, like if you drop this, you know exactly what the acceleration is and it sets. So that's not what I mean. I'm talking about big picture questions, such as what is the universe, right? Well, if you ask Columbus what is the universe in 1492, he'll give you a, an answer that was very much what Aristotle had said many, many, many years before him, which was Earth is in the center of everything, right? And you had this sort of like onion-like structure where the Earth is the center and each planet is being carried around by an invisible crystal sphere. So the idea there is that the planets rotate around the Earth because they were stuck to these transparent crystal spheres. And at the, end, at, the, at the very end here, you had the stars, you know, the sphere of the stars. And beyond that, you had sort of the realm of gods and the, uh, God, sorry, and the saints. And that was it. So that was the vision that was everybody believed in. And there was something quite interesting about this vision because that was the cosmic vision, but that was also their theological vision and there was also how architecture reflected this vision. So if you go to a, goth, a Gothic cathedral, maybe there is one at Hearst Castle, I don't know. But if you go there, what you see is verticality, right? You, you go into a Gothic cathedral, and what you want to do is you want to look up and like, whoa, you know, why is that? Well, because 
That's what people want to do. They want to ascend towards, you know, God in heaven. And so the architecture reflected a cosmic order and reflected a value order as well. People believed in that, and to them, the goal of their lives was to ascend in grace too. So there was a, a, a very deep connection between what you believed in and how the universe was like. Right? It was a connection in a very deep sense. And so when Copernicus came into the game in 1543, he published the book and said, sorry folks, you know, Earth is not the center. It's really just a planet moving about the sun. And it's not even that special. For example, you know, other planets uh, can be bigger and can have moons too. So it's not like we're the only ones that have moons. Copernicus didn't know that, but he inferred that Earth was sort of mediocre and not really that important, right? And that upset everybody. It pissed people off tremendously. And in fact, the, pers the first person that was upset was not the Catholic Church itself, was Luther, you know? So Martin Luther was the one first person that criticized Copernicus, saying there is this foolish astrologer that wanted to turn the universe upside down and tell us that the Earth is rotating around like a merry-go-round. Right? I mean, look around. Do you see that? No. I mean, is, are you getting dizzy? No. If, if, you know, and the Aristotelian arguments were like, hey, if the earth rotates, how come the birds can keep up? Right? <laughs> because if, you, if they're not touching the earth, how can they? And, and if you could do the calculation, right, for something that has a radius of about 7,000 kilometers to rotate around in uh, 24 hours, you know, at the equator, you have to be moving like 2,000 kilometers an hour, right? So the birds have to be damn fast, right, to keep up with that. <laughs> and, and, the moon, and the clouds would stay behind. So that was the Aristotelian notion because they didn't know inertia. But that was their reality. That was the way they conceived of the world. And so Copernicus came, and then the sun became the center, right? And people loved that. Some people loved that idea. Not a lot of people. But some people, like Kepler, right, who is one of my great heroes. Kepler is an amazing fellow for many, many reasons. Um, but one of the things he did is that the sun has to be the center. He came up with these crazy arguments of why that was true, that mixed theology and astrology and mathematics. But for him, there was a fundamental reason for that to be the case. And the sun was the center for a very long time until, of course, it was realized that, you know, all stars are suns, right? And they have Possibly, they didn't know, but they could have planets around that. And when you get to the 20th century, the vision of the universe changed completely again, right? So now you have a universe that is like this, and let me put it like that because it's too bad we have so much light because this is, to me, and I'm, I know I'm biased, one of the most amazing photographs ever taken, right? This is so-called the Hubble Deep Field photograph, which basically tells you what are these things here, right? Well, each one of these smudges is clear it's a galaxy, right? And, and I love to show this picture to people because it is mind-blowing, incredible, how big this is, right? So just think about it. You say, oh, what about these little dots? Are they little stars? No, they're galaxies too. They're just farther away. So this is a very deep, long exposure picture that collected a lot of light coming from very far away, integrated, and this is why it comes true. So, so the distances you're talking about galaxies here are of, of tens of millions of light years, right? And, and our galaxy, our Milky Way, is sort of like a spiral, kind of like this one. I ask people, you know, where's the Milky Way here? Can you find it, right? <laughs> and, and, and people go, what? You know, and people say, yeah, it's that one, it's that one. I'm like, okay, we have to work harder. <laughs> We're not doing our job very well here. We have to work hard because that's kind of sad. But anyways, um, so let's go to our Milky Way. The Milky Way, which is this one here, I fooled you. I've, I've, <laughs> it has 100,000 light years diameter, right? So that means that if I turn on this laser on one side, it has to be a really good laser, and it, it will go through if the black hole in the middle doesn't suck it in. All the way to the other side, it takes about 100,000 light years for that to happen. So that's the size of the Milky Way, right? And the distances we're talking about here of, of tens, sometimes even hundreds of, of millions of light years. And what's really amazing about astronomy is that whenever you look at the sky, you're really looking at the past, right? There's no such thing as the present information about the sky, 
right? So for example, when you look at the moon, you're seeing the moon at about 1.2 seconds as it were, because that's how long light takes to travel from the moon to us. When you look at the sun, it takes about eight minutes, a little bit over eight minutes, which basically means that if the sun exploded right now, it would take about eight minutes for us to find out, it would be the last thing you'll ever know. Sun exploded, end, Caltech, <laughs> you know? So end of Caltech because of this. So, but the point here is that when you're looking at the sky, you're looking at a time machine to the past, right? And that tells you something interesting because as light is traveling to, in fact, let me just make a small parenthesis that in the book I talk much more about, but we don't have time today. Actually, you are looking at me one billionth of a second ago, right? And you say, no, this is right now. It's happening right now. There is no such thing as right now. Right now is a cognitive fabrication. You know, it's the way our brains, because they're kind of slow compared to the speed of light a lot, and I actually do the calculation in the book to tell you how slow. Um, the point is that what we think is happening at the moment as the present is really a fabrication. In fact, mathematically, quantity is like instantaneous, eternal, you know, infinite, make a lot of sense. Physically, they really don't. They mean, you know, they are just kind of crutches that we use to explain things that are kind of either too fast or too small. Because to say something is, is instantaneous, you need to have an experiment that could have a resolution of zero. And you can't do that, right? You have always, again, going back to the instruments, a precision limit, right? So whenever we make a statement like that, we have to remember the limitations of what that statement, um, where, where that statement is coming from and the limitations implied in it. Okay, so now the picture of the universe um, changes even more because 1929, not too far from here, you know, Edwin Hubble discovered that these galaxies are not staying there. They're actually moving away from one another, right? So there is this expansion of the universe, which people, uh, so you, you imagine that these galaxies are moving away. If I had like the God button here, you know, I'd push the God button and you guys would each be a galaxy, which is kind of a cool idea and you would each move away. This is a two-dimensional surface here, right, where you are right now. So if you move north, west, uh, north, south, east, west at the same rate, you look at your neighbors and you see everybody moving away from you. And you're like, wow, you know, the this room is, is expanding, is moving, but I'm the center. Check it out, you know, everybody's moving away from me. <laughs> but then the person like, hey, wait a second, man. I'm the center too because everybody's moving away from me. And so the point is that the expansion of the universe does not have a center, which is confusing, right? Because people say, wait, if you play this movie backwards, right, what happens? Well, I play the movie backwards, everybody's getting closer and closer and closer, and you start getting on top of one another, a big ball of people, and then you keep squeezing this. At some point in the past, everybody's going to be together at a single mathematical point of zero volume. What the heck is that, right? And that is called the singularity. So the picture we have of the universe now is a very dynamic picture where galaxies are not just out there very far away, but they're also moving away from one another, right? So the universe has a history, just like we have a history. The universe has a birthday, right? And so if you put together the information that light has a finite speed, 186,000 186, uh, miles per second, Right, which is another ridiculous number. What it basically means is that if you blink your eye, light goes seven and a half times around the Earth. Right? And so if that's true, and if this light is coming from far away, from these very far away objects, and the universe has a finite age, there is only so far light could have traveled within that time of 14 billion years, which is now we know the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years plus or minus 100 or so, so it's pretty good. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have said anything like that if I came here to, to say that. You know, now we have a much more precise measurement of the age of the universe. So the bang, whatever that was, happened at about 13.8 billion years ago, which tells you that light had traveled for, actually you'd say, oh, for 13.8 billion light years, wrong. That would be true if the universe was static. It turns out because of the expansion of the universe, light gets kind of a lift, like a surfer on a surfboard being carried by the wave, 
right, a little farther out. The ex and the expansion here is not the expansion like of galaxies as shrapnel from a bomb that exploded in the center, but is the stretch of space itself, right? So when I talked about you guys moving away from one another, you're not walking, it was this, the, the floor itself that was stretching, right? So the expansion of the universe is not like the galaxies a little shell, you know, pieces of a bomb that are moving away from one another, it's that space itself is stretchy. Okay, you only see that at the level of millions of years, of light years, of distance. So say galaxies don't stretch, the solar system doesn't stretch, we don't stretch, well, at least not this way anyways. Um, but the universe stretches, right? And so light has traveled 46 billion light years from the beginning of time, let's call that. Which tells you something quite interesting, if that's true, what? What happens beyond that, right? I mean, is the universe end? Is this like a bowl? Like, you know, that's it, and you go like a knock, right? And the answer is no, it continues. But we cannot receive information from beyond that boundary. So we are like a fish in a light bowl of information that has the radius of how far light has traveled since the beginning of time. So what's beyond that is unknowable. It's not just unknown, because we don't know. It's unknowable. Unless you come up with a new physics that says that, hey, speed of light is not the limit. You can go faster, whatever. There is the interstellar movie where you go through you know, wormholes that can do that. The point is, from what we understand right now, you cannot know beyond that. And that is just part of our scientific knowledge today. Okay, but the point I wanted to make connecting with the past is that um, these worldviews are changing, right? From Columbus to Copernicus to us now, we have these completely different ways of picturing the cosmic reality, right? And right now we are immersed in mystery again, which is wonderful from a physics perspective, right? Sorry, John Horgan, you know, we actually are very confused about some very fundamental things about the universe right now, as I'll tell you, because we really don't know what the universe is made of, right? I mean, the composition, the material composition of the universe is a big question. So let me move on to materials right now, right? And, um, and as you know, when we talk about matter, the first question, and that was already known a long time ago, was Lucipus and Democritus that said, you know, every little thing is made of these atoms, right, what cannot be cut. So the notion of atomism is very old indeed, and modern atoms are very different from the Greek atoms, but still the idea is the same, that there is some fundamental building block of stuff that you can put together, and we call them elementary particles, right? And um, I have a picture here of, it's a self-portrait of Humbra, right? And it's interesting because he's always this gloomy guy. I don't know if you've seen this other self part when he was older, but he's happy there. And he's happy because he's painting himself as Democritus. Okay, so it's a self-portrait in the likeness of Democritus. That's what, uh, and why is that? Well, because Democritus' nickname was the laughing philosopher. And he was laughing because he was happy. And why was he happy? Because he understood that the use of, this is perfect for the skeptic society, that the use of reason is the only way to freedom. That any kind of belief in superstition is an enslavement of the mind. So the ability to develop your self-critical way of thinking, that you can look at things critically, is the way to understand the path to happiness. And Democritus was, was that guy. Right, so he had this nickname, and he was incredibly prolific. As a, and you know, he put us on the road, okay, let's understand the very small. And we have done tremendously well right, with that. And um, the Higgs is the last, well, it's the most recent, not the last, piece of the puzzle from what the world is made of. But we came up and we realized that you know, all the chemical elements, first, huge simplification, right? You have 92, perhaps 93, depend who you talk to, um, stable chemical element, naturally occurring chemical elements, and they're all made of three particles. That's an awesome simplification, right? So we have protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? And then you go and say, okay, what else is there? And we look for it, and we find just 12 fundamental particles, 
plus the Higgs. Okay? And, um, and that is remarkable. Now, when we put that into the context of cosmology, okay, is the world, the universe, made of all, only that, right? Meaning those galaxies that we just saw, the stars, is that all there is to it? And the answer is a big no, right? And the composition of the universe is really weird. So right now, this little sliver here, which is about 4%, is the stuff made of atoms, or at least of electrons and protons and neutrons. So if you look at what is the universe, what is the recipe? Let's make a universe today. Okay, you take 4% of protons and electrons, essentially, okay? And what about the rest, right? Well, the rest is 22% of something and, and about 73% of something else, and we don't really know what they are exactly. We, we, we have an idea of their properties, right? But we don't quite know what they are. And in fact, it's kind of interesting that even of the known matter, only about 0.5% is the stars and et cetera. Et cetera means the planets and us, okay, and all that other stuff. And, and stuff that doesn't shine, but they're still made of protons, et cetera, right? So we are definitely in the minority here, right? And there are these two other ingredients, which are quite, well, we are quite certain they're there, right? There are some descent, but minimal in a sense. And they are basically what we call dark matter and dark energy, right? So dark matter, essentially, we know it's made of particles. And it's stuff that is, doesn't shine, hence the name dark, right? But it's not made of protons and electrons, etc. So there are many candidates for what these particles. So we thought, for example, I mentioned neutrinos at the beginning of the lecture. We thought for a long time they could be neutrinos. It doesn't look like it, right? It looks like they really are made of something completely different. We have no clue yet what it is. We've been searching for those particles for over two decades, three decades now, and we haven't captured them. And by the way, you're being, uh, a, you know, you're being, those guys are colliding with you right now, too, these dark matter particles. So every galaxy has a cloak of this dark, it's sort of like a little, uh, 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 like, a, you know, you have a beehive and then you have all the bees moving around. Those are the, part, the dark matter particles. We do not know their constitution yet. We don't know what they are, but they are par they're present, right? And this one, is, is even more, and then by the way, this was discovered in the 1930s here at Caltech, by the way, by Fritz Wicke. So he was a Swiss American astronomer who had a powerful telescope to look at how galaxies move about one another, right? And he realized they were moving way too fast for the matter to just be made of the stuff he could see. So he said that there's invisible matter out there pulling these galaxies around. And, and that's the dark matter. So we've known about this for a long time. There are many, many other ways that we know about it that I can't go into right now. And then you have this thing that was discovered in 1998. That, that was a complete surprise to everybody. It was the kind of stuff like you say, please go away. Please be a mistake. I mean, everybody wanted to, um, exactly the opposite of what has happened with the gravitational wave discovery from March 17th, right? which people saw the waves from the Big Bang, many Nobel Prizes will come through, and unfortunately, it looks like it's really wrong, right? It's just dust from the galaxy, which is kind of embarrassing, which should teach some people to not have press releases before having their papers peer reviewed, you know? It was, uh, but you know, I mentioned that because, and I had mentioned that in my NPR blog as well, I write for NPR every week, and right then I said, this is dangerous, you know, because you could be wrong, and if you're wrong, this is what science does not need. You know, this is an attack. It can be used as an attack on the integrity of science. Say, these guys are full of it. Look, they're saying that they discovered that and they are wrong. So how they can be right about global, global weather, for example, right? And, and, you know, so these things can be used, right, politically against us. So, to, be, uh, to have this integrity, to be very careful about statements, I think is extremely important. And that's another one of these missions. And that's why I said this is a skeptical book about science from a scientist in the sense that I think we have to protect science from bloated, um, um, how do you call it, bloated um, pronouncements out there in the media, right? We have to be very careful what we can say and cannot say, and if we're saying it, Make sure they say, but we're not sure yet, 
or this is still speculation, you know, or it's an extrapolation from a current idea that we haven't verified. Kind of, you know, things like that, that uh, Steve Pinker didn't like it very much when he, he talked about, you know, but, but honestly, in, when you're talking about cutting edge science, you have to do that. Otherwise, you give people the wrong idea, and that can just hurt us, you know. Anyways, um, so the dark energy is telling us that the universe not, not just is accelerating, but is accelerating, not just is expanding, but it is accelerating real fast. That is like there's something that wants to make space stretch much faster than we all anticipated, okay? And there are wonderful uh, ideas about what that could be, including the energy of nothing. You can ask me what do I mean by that in the <laughs> questions, you know? But uh, we are still not sure. So essentially, we only know about 5% of the composition of the universe. Like you're going to bake a cake, there are three ingredients, you know how much of each of them, but you don't know what they are, right? You know one of them. Start with water. Okay, then what? Well, <coughs> you know. so it's going to be a funny cake. And, and, that's, and that's not a defeat of science, and, and that's a point that I always make. This is exactly how science works, is by discovering things that trump you. And that's why it's so exciting to be doing it, because you can be surprised by nature because it always is definitely smarter than you are. Um, so this is something that our friend Democritus said, 400 years BC, okay, that we know nothing. And he was the guy who knew the most in the world, at least in the Western world at the time. And he said that, you know, if truth, what the heck does that mean, right? I mean, you, you make sense of things the best possible way, right? And let me just mention also a third part, which is the cognitive part, you know, and you have to say that dualism is pretty much in bad shape these days, right? So sorry, Descartes, you know, it was, was a good point, but which brings us to the new mysteries of what the heck is going on in our heads, right? And I'm glad you're going to have an expert talk about that, you know, I'm just the outsider thinking about this. Um, I have to say that I jumped a huge part of, of, of the argument here, which is about the nature of quantum physics and quantum reality, which I'll be glad to answer questions. I just want to keep to the time here um, because it turns out that the way we look at the world, you know, the, the way we see things is what we can call a classic way of looking at things, which is very different from the way very small things behave, electrons, atoms, etc. There's a whole different set of rules to describe the world of the very small, the world of quantum physics, right? And there's kind of a clash between the two, right? And what's really interesting about that, let me just say this, that is that in, in quantum physics, we have this curious situation where we have a technology, meaning we have the formalism, we have the mathematics that works incredibly well. We know how to write the equations that describe the probability the electron is going to be here or there, or it's going to have this energy or that energy. And solving these equations, which is the hard work of physicists, undergraduates, graduates, and, and, and beyond, right, is something we know how to do. And because of that, and some of the applications of that, you have iPhones, et cetera, iPads, you know, I think about 30% of the gross domestic product of the United States is derivative from some sort of quantum physics. Okay, so, and th this is remarkable, right? Because it all started with a bunch of guys in the early 20th century trying to figure out some results from experiments and see what is, what is this thing, the atom, and how is its structure, and look at the tremendous transformation that that questioning created, right? Enter music. Um, so, so the point there is that we have this technology, but we don't know how to interpret it. Or there are different ways of interpreting what quantum mechanics is really doing, and they clash with one another, right? And what's really more interesting about it is that when you look at very simple quantum systems, like a single photon or two photons that are prepared in a state where they are what we call entangled, or so let's say they have polarizations, right? So let's just say polarization for the light waves, they, they propagate you know, the electric field propagates up and down like this. Um, photons, which are the particle bits of these electromagnetic waves, they also can have a polarization that you can represent by an arrow 
depending where this polarization is going to, right? And so you can create pairs of photons that have um, the same polarization up, up like this. And, um, and it's the interesting thing about this is that when you separate these photons, so they're, they're made to move away from one another, right? And you measure one of them, right? You immediately know what the polarization of the other one is going to be, right? Sort of instantaneously, because they are prepared with the same polarization. So you sort of know that. But what's really amazing is that you cannot tell if the polarization, let's say it's a simple system and the things can only point up or down. So you have 50-50% probability you know, these guys are going to point up or down. Well, it turns out that you are going to measure it, and they're going to say, oh, it's pointing up. So his friend is also pointing up, OK? That's because these photons are an entangled pair, and they form a unit. But what you cannot tell is, before measuring, you cannot tell if it's going to point up or down. There's a fundamental indeterminacy on the direction of this until you measure it, OK? And that is not something as far as we can understand, that can be explained with any formalism that we have right now. In fact, it's been discovered in the last two decades, I said I wasn't going to talk about quantum physics, and here I am, but um, in the last two decades, experiments have shown that you cannot construct a theory that can explain what's going on to the photons locally, meaning you cannot describe a cause and effect relation that will let you predict, oh yeah, this guy is going to point down, hey, point it down, we win. That's to do with Einstein's dream of predictability, right? He wanted to have a science that could predict these things, and it turns out that you cannot, because there is no local theory that can do that. We talk about no locality now in the quantum level, which basically means you cannot have a theory that can explain that, which basically means at the very fundamental core of how matter and radiation behaves, you have unknowables. So at the very large, and at the very small, these unknowables keep popping up. So that is what perhaps Einstein meant that we should fill us with a sense of humility. You know, that look, there are real limits to what's going on here. Unless you throw away the way we understand science now, but that's a ridiculous counter argument, right? Then it's, everything's possible if you, if you do that. So down to my mind, right? And I'm going to be very brief here because I'm blowing my time already. Um, the question then is, how does matter think, right? I mean, this is, I think there are two amazing questions you can ask about the nature of matter. One is, how did non-living matter became living? So the transition from inorganic to organic living matter that happened on Earth at least 3.5 billion years ago, right? It's an amazing, very complex question, right? How did this happen? How do we even define that, right? Um, and the other one is, how do, Neurons, about 85 billion of them, uh, of them in a, 85 billion of them in our minds, with their thousands of synapses, create thought, right? And 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 not just create thought, but give you a sense of self, which is your sense of self, right? I mean, you're going to wake up tomorrow, perhaps a little different from you are today, but essentially the same. You know, unless somebody knocks you in the head or you come out, you have a brain aneurysm or something horrible, it's going to be pretty much the, this sameness, right, is happening in your head somehow, and we don't quite know exactly how that's happening. So one of the big questions we have in this issue of reality and is, is that can we create machines that are able to replicate human thought, right? And there is a whole big question you can ask, a whole big debate you can have about that. And there are two camps, right? You have the camp that, of course, all you need is really powerful computers. And the brain is essentially just a bunch of neurons interconnected with one another. And they have sort of a binary on-off kind of thing, right? And so if you're able to simulate that very carefully with giant machines, you need uh, 10 to 18 operations per second, more or less, to mimic the brain. And it turns out that the fastest computers are getting there. And the estimate is that by 2018, they will be there. So the question is, aha, that, that, does that mean that the computing power will allow us to simulate the human brain, right? So there's a whole human brain project in Europe, and there is the Obama brain project here in the United States, where essentially people are trying to do that. 
So the question is, is that even possible? You know? And so, again, cautionary here. First of all, uh, we don't really know how to decode the whole brain yet. So when we say neurons and synapses, and the, uh, the guy, Henry Markram, who is the guy who is heading this European project, which is the biggest grant ever given in science, uh, 1 billion euros. It's a hell of a lot of money to understand something that small, but that's, that's wonderful. It should be done, you know? Um, he also wants to put all the um, chemistry of the brain. So not just, you know, it's not just the electric components, but the flow of neurotransmitters and how they come through. So it's an incredibly complex idea. And the question, is that going to be enough, right? Well, obviously, the first answer, based on, on the argument here, is it can't be enough because we only know so much of the brain now. And so we'll be able to put all that information together, perhaps in a very complicated simulation. But who is to say that that's all there is to know about the brain at this point, right? So that's the first cautionary tale. Then there is the other one, which have to do with the people called the New Mysterians, which I love the name, right? And the New Mysterians are a bunch of philosophers and, and, and actually cognitive neuroscientists too, like Steve Pinker is one of them, that says that, you know what? We cannot figure it out. We cannot understand consciousness. It's because to just map the level of brain activity, oh, look, I'm sad, so this, these neurons are, are, are firing. I'm happy these neurons are firing is a completely different question from understanding selfness or consciousness, the nature of consciousness, that there is a change, a big gap in understanding your, understand your experience of the self, you know, your oneness. So when you look at a painting and I look at a painting, different things are going to happen to the two of us, even though the information is essentially the same. What's going on there? Can we figure that out? And the answer, according to them, is probably not, which doesn't mean that it's an unsolvable problem. It just means that we cannot solve it. Perhaps a more advanced intelligent, intelligence will be able to solve it, which is an argument that a philosopher called Colin McGinn um, makes. And, and just to um, bring this to a, a closing, you know, you cannot know for a fact that we are not really in the matrix, right? Um, <laughs> Because if our understanding, remember how I started this whole thing, right? We started talking about our understanding of reality comes from the sensorial perception that is being collected by our senses. Okay, so what if, you know, just like in the matrix, this stuff is being fed to your brain and you don't know about it and you imagine that this is all real, but it is not. Let me give you another possibility. And, and can you tell the difference? You know, are there ways? So some colleagues wrote a paper, a physics paper, about if we lived in a simulation, you know, and you have this sort of reticulate structure of reality, you know, like a, a lattice, we call it. A lattice has a resolution. So how fine does the resolution of this lattice needs to be for us to figure out that it's fake? You know? And that would be a horrible discovery, right? If said, wow, we're really living in a dream here. Look, the aliens that made this, so this uh, stuff messed up and didn't realize that above a certain energy, we could actually probe the nature of their simulation, right? And it turns out to be a very difficult thing to do, even though it sounds apparently ridiculous, right? That for, of course, this is not a simulation. But imagine that you are a character in The Sims. You know The Sims, right, the game? Um, where you have to take care of the family, et cetera. Now, fast forward, not to this version of The Sims, but to the version of The Sims from 2060, okay, where machines are going to be incredibly powerful. And those characters are going to be so sophisticated that they may, become, they may believe they are autonomous. You know? And they believe that they are actually making the decisions about should I change the baby's diaper now or not, when they're just characters in a game that our grandchildren will be playing. Right? And who is to go tell the Sims that that's not true? Right? So these are very fundamental questions about reality that sort of make us a little uncomfortable because they have to do it free will, blah, blah, not the talk. But um, that's why I want to go back to the beginning here and just spend the last 
30 seconds explaining what do I mean by the island of knowledge and how this illuminates the way we do science and we think about science. So imagine that everything that we know fits in an, in an island, right? And clearly, as time goes by, as we argued, this island changes shape and the coastline gets a little fractal, you know, like you know more about stuff. Sometimes you have ideas that you think are right, but they're actually wrong, like the ether in the 19th century, so the island may shrink a little bit, right? But on average, it's growing, right? Now, as every good island, this island is also surrounded by an ocean, the ocean of the unknown, unknown, the stuff that we don't know, right? Now, People would say, hey, as the island grows, you know, this ocean of the unknown is becoming smaller and smaller, and eventually there'll be no more unknown, the end of science, right? And that is completely wrong, because what you have is you have the island of knowledge, you have the ocean of the unknown, and you have the shores, which are the line of our ignorance, right? Which is basically the marking the boundary of knowledge and unknown, and essentially what happens, as I argued, is that as the island grows, those shores also grow, which basically means that we learn more, but we become equipped to ask questions that we could not have anticipated before. And that is exactly what has happened throughout the history of science. Microscope before and after, the telescope before and after, and many different kinds of telescopes or instruments. So basically this means that the more we know about reality, the more we are going to need to know about reality because there are more things for us to figure out. And that is not a defeatist way of thinking about science. That is actually a very wonderful way to think about science because to me, nothing more depressing than to say that science could have an end. No, it's exactly the opposite. It can't because of the very nature of the way we pursue knowledge, right? So that's the idea. And that's the known, and you have the unknown there, and you have these little islands of unknowables in there. I sound like, what is it, uh, Rumsfeld, that came with known unknowns, etc. But the way to think about that is think that limits are not really obstacles, but they're triggers. You know, there are ways in which we load up our imagination to figure things out, right? And it is not to get to the end of things that matter, in a sense. It's really to keep looking for things that matter, right? And that search is the thing that matters. So one last metaphor, right? So you're a mountain climber, right? And you're climbing the mountain, and you work really hard. You prepare yourself. You pack your gear, and you're going up, and you see this big mountain. You go all the way to the top of the mountain, and you get there, and you say, all right, cool. Got to the top. Now I can go down. No. You go to the top of the mountain, and you look around, and you see, ha. Look at all these other mountains out there. They are much taller. I can go to other mountains. And then when you get to the tallest one, you look up to the sky and say, space. So that, to me, is the way to think about reality, and not in any closed final form, including the theory of everything. But that's another story. So that is the last sentence I wanted to talk to you about. It's really a mosaic of ideas, the way you construct meaning as we measure and understand the world better. That's it. Thank you very much. with one, you talk in the book about uh, Thomas Nagel's famous paper, What It's Like to Be a Bat. And really, the only way to know would be you'd have to be a bat. And you wouldn't know you were a human wondering what it's like to be a bat. You'd be the bat wondering what it's like to be a human. Anyway, uh, so that, that gets to the power of, of the relativity of worldviews of, of a sort if you can't know what other worldviews are like. But, but so if I approach the podium here, photons of light bounce off, and I know I have to go around it like this. And if the bat comes at it, his echolocation tells him there's something there, and he has to go around. So isn't this, why can't I say that's objective reality? Mm -hmm. um, Me or the bat or any other organ. Oh, sure you can. This, this, this thing is objective reality. Reality at this level, at sensorial level, it's perfectly fine. You know, that's not a problem. Um, you know, some people in, in quantum physics would say, well, there is no real objective reality because you can't really separate the observer from what's being observed, right? But I think that's a little forced because there is a clear separation of scales where classical physics does work, 
and quantum physics is not necessary. But the way to think about it is that the world is quantum and that approximation we call classical physics applies at a certain level, right? But, um, but the question we have is what level is that? What separates these two scales? And that's where your question may be. And you know, because at some point, the classical description just doesn't work anymore. I really have to use the quantum description. But nobody really knows exactly where that is. Another way of phrasing the question is this. We don't really see an electron, right? I mean, these particle detectors, we don't see any of that stuff. We, we, we collect clicks in detectors or little lines, right? So there is a huge process of amplification of a signal of something that hits the first detector, a photomultiplier, then multiplies that signal, and then we say, oh, who, an electron, you know? Now, that's really a construction. You know, what we, what we call an electron is really a construction, theoretical construction, that explains what we measure. So the question becomes, wait a second, a detector is also made of atoms and electrons. But we are treating it classically. So how many electrons do you need, you know, to make a detector a classical thing? And that is sort of the big, quick, difficult question that we don't know about. But at this level, sure, I mean, there is no question, you know, is the moon there when you're not thinking, right? That's the famous question that is attributed to Einstein. I'm not sure it's true. But, and the point is that it is there because uh, there, there is no superposition of moon here, moon there states, which would be the quantum, because there is something called decoherence in quantum physics that basically says that environmental influences break these weird quantum effects, especially at large objects. So the moon, the moon is there. Thanks. So, okay. I was confused. Why did Spine say uh, sorry, Descartes? Oh, because Descartes had the notion of the, the, the dualism of mind and, and soul, um, body and matter and soul. So he believed there was. I think therefore, it was so what, what would contradict that? Well, there is no soul. There is just matter. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what. Sure, yeah, but, but the idea there was there was a supernatural entity that was immortal, that was in our heads, that is just not there, you know. So what we're saying, what I mean by that, it's a very valid question. I mean is, um, as far as we can tell, there's just matter. And the mystery is, how does that happen? You know, how can matter engender you with a sense of self? And that's really the tough question. Descartes believed in this dualism, and we're saying there's really no dualism. There's just a very complicated question we don't know, which is related to how matter creates this emergent sense of, of who you are. Yeah? yeah. I'm always really close to my heart. Um, I believe Plato and Descartes were trying to show the same distinction between what we perceive and maybe a higher level of reality. But let's not put a hierarchy set up on this dualistic reality that they both believe in. The best part of the cave analogy to me was when the slave slash prisoner actually leaves, escapes, sees the burning light, a metaphor for truth, sees reality and goes back to the people in the cave and says, hey guys, reality is such and such, and they go, nay, this is reality right here. So I feel like science is this tool that actually elucidates reality and, and, and says nay to Isaiah Berlin's relativistic statement that oh, it, anything that starts with an all is false because that, that itself is self-defeating. Do, do you see where I'm going? That, that statement is self-defeating. It's as if it's on an island and claiming this is the only pinnacle of truth. So going back to that gentleman's statement on Descartes, regardless of there's a God, regardless if there's a soul, there seems to be a qualitative difference in what matter can substantiate. And Nagel's article is to show that distinction between <coughs> sensory modalities that are different, yet they, they still depict the objective world of that desk or whatever, but the bat has a sensory modality which we can't phenomenologically experience. And that it, it's very different than a deaf person clicking it's, it's echolocation, it's completely different, and it, it took a long time to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... I'm, I'm with you. I mean, there's one, one small correction. I'm sorry, Richard, when it comes to Descartes, I don't mm -hmm. feel like there's a contradiction because I still feel like there's enough of a qualitative difference between matter substantiating what we call inanimate objects and consciousness. 
sure, no question. Just one small correction. In the allegory of the cave, um, the slave goes back and is horrified by seeing the light. He doesn't really tell people, hey, it's awesome, there is a light there. He actually cannot stand it. And, and the whole argument goes that in order to be able to look at the light, you have to be educated. Because, you know, the whole project of the Republic was a pedag pedagogy, right? It was how do I create philosopher kings? You know, how do I make a better ruler that is not just a ruler, just, but also enlightened, so to speak, right? And so, just a small correction. So he was saying that that slave, poor guy, he, he was blinded by the light and, and ran away. But, but I agree with you that um, there is definite complexity, and it's a remarkable complexity in the brain. But dualism does not seem to explain it any better. In fact, it doesn't explain anything. You know, that's, and I think that's the point. So, so if you're with me on, on, on non-dual existence of weird stuff and difficult things going in the brain, then we're all together. I think, just to, sorry, it's really quick answer. I think that dualism doesn't necessarily substantiate an immaterial or spiritual, oh. it's just that the substantiating difference that emerges is of a qualitative difference worthy of a distinction. Sure, but that's not what Descartes had in mind. So when uh, inanimate matter makes life, mm -hmm. I kind of see the same thing when life creates consciousness of a certain characteristic. Yes, yes, but it's all matter. <laughs> that's... <laughs> that's... Philosophers of mind call it physicalism. They go, there's two physical matters. Okay, that... yeah. No, I'm sure, sure. It just doesn't need to be supernatural. That's, yes. Right. And everything else is just dreamy. Yeah, but I, most, a lot of people are not that honest about it. And they, they, and, and they believe there is such a thing as an ultimate reality. And there may be, see, the point is, there may be something out there at the bottom of everything, but we can't figure it out. And that's what, what's hard for, for people to, to swallow, so to speak. You know, it takes a lot of humility to say, you know what? We can't figure everything out, you know. Is that a bad thing or a good thing, you know? And so um, I think it's a f wonderful thing to not know everything. But I agree with you that people should definitely be very careful about how they define reality. What do they mean by their word, right? Which is like another word that is confusing these days is spirituality, right? Which has such a bad connotation, but you have some Harris now you know, writing a book about, wait, let's rescue that word, you know, what the heck, you know, what, what does that really mean? It means a connection which is meaningful to things which are bigger than you are, and it does not have anything to do with belief in whatever. So, anyway, so, yes, okay, thank you for your comment. So, um, in, when dark matter and dark energy were first proposed, uh, there wasn't a lot of acceptance in the scientific community, and now there is great acceptance, and yet still no evidence Speak to what that says about our state of science. And <laughs> That's very good. Um, with dark matter, um, there are so many ways in which we know it's there. You know, it's not just, so Fritz Wicke here did one measurement of, basically you have galaxies in a cluster and they move about like busy bees, you know, and you can sort of map that and you can, measure their velocities and say, if, if all there is here pushing things around is gravity, there's a lot of gravity here, there's more mass than we can see. So that was, but now there are other ways. So galaxies, they, as everything, right? They, everything rotates in the universe pretty much, right? So galaxies rotate, spiral galaxies rotate, and they have a velocity curve <laughs> that you can measure. And according to Newtonian physics, which would describe that, uh, they, so 
you measure how the velocity changes as a function of the distance from the center of the star, uh, the galaxy. So, you know, here's my spire, right? It has a distance, a radius r. There is a distance. So the way you would use Newtonian physics to describe that, the velocity would go up and then it would go down to zero. So meaning the outside things would have less speed. What people measure is this, is a flattening out. And so the only way, one way in which this could be explained is, you know, hey, there's more stuff out there and that's why this is happening. But then you say, is that all there is? With? No, there are other ways in which you can talk about dark matter. There are several, and they all kind of get together, and they all give you the same 24% or so. For example, as you know, gravity, uh, Einstein's theory of gravity talks about how light, uh, matter can bend space, right? And so if you're here on Earth, so here's us, right, with a little telescope. There is a telescope there. There's a guy looking at something. Uh, if there is like, a, a body of, of, of lots of mass like a galaxy and, and, and there is some other one like a source of light, okay? What's going to happen is that the source of light is going to go through this galaxy and it's going to be bent because space around here is, 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 is curved. And you can measure how much of a curvature you need if the light was everything that was here. And what you find is that you need about a factor of five more matter to do the curving, the deviation from what you expect, which means all this invisible. So that's a third way. So there are many, many ways in which this does. So it looks like a problem that is here to stay, and it's a big mystery. Some people say, well, maybe you should modify gravity. You know, Einstein's theory may not be good enough. And there have been some serious proposals there, but that falls into all sorts of problems as well. So there is this tension going on there. Dark energy is kind of recent. It is something we wanted to go away because it's so weird. But it's, I mean, what is the, it's like the ether, right? It's, uh, the way we picture it right now is essentially there is a fluid-like thing everywhere in the universe that has the property of pushing space apart. No, science fiction can get more interesting than that, really, right? <laughs> so what could that be? And there are very reasonable possibilities, right? But we are far from understanding it. And one of the key questions about dark energy just is that we have to find out, we look, remember how I said that looking at the universe is like looking back in time. So the question is, if you look at the universe at different ages, sort of like baby, you know, like teenager, adult, is this dark energy doing the same thing? Or is it always doing this, or is it doing something different? So does it change in time? And that question is, is a fundamental question in cosmology right now. Does dark energy evolve in time, or is it a constant? Oh. You mentioned something I wasn't sure I heard the right way. Yeah. Right, about how far light can travel since the beginning. Right. That's the big thing. I think you said four to six. Forty-six. Four to six. No, 40, four, six billion. forty-six billion years. So if the universe were not expanding and it had a certain size, it would be the age of the universe, 13.8 billion light years. But the thing is that light, because space is stretching, light gets a lift and it gets pushed farther out because of the expansion of the universe and the results about, it's sort of like a surfer, right? I mean, if there is no wave, the surfer is standing there, right? And uh, if it swims, it's gonna cover a certain distance in time. But if he's swimming and the wave comes, he'll cover a much bigger distance in that same amount of time because the wave is helping him. So the expansion of the universe is helping light to cover more ground than if- So the question I'm, I'm uh -huh. having trouble with is, when we look along some point of view out to some star, how time-wise far away is it? We, you have to, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, we correct, we, yeah, we can see things that uh, there are, <coughs> about almost to the edge, right? Not quite, but almost. So. And we can correct for that because we know the expansion rate. We know how fast the universe is expanding, so we can correct for, for the time it took for the thing to travel. So, so yeah. The light traveled a distance, be, be careful with these numbers. So the light traveled a bigger distance than 13.8 billion light years, but within always within that maximum amount of time of 13.8 billion years. Yeah, right. Okay. That's where the edge is for us right now. That is our, that's our bowl. 
And then the multiverse. Even talk about the multiverse. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, there are gazillions of questions, Michael. Just, just that was the guy all the way at the last. Yeah. In uh, researching more about uh, dark matter, do we need additional, more accurate instruments, or is it the mathematical calculations? What would you think? Um, that's a fair question. Um, so how the heck do you detect something that weird, right? I mean, I mean, we detect it indirectly, like I said here. These are all indirect astronomical, what we call indirect astronomical evidence. You know, nobody went there and grabbed a piece of dark matter. We want to get a piece of dark matter here. And if the Earth is like a spaceship, which it is, traveling around the galaxy, it's definitely being dark matter particles are colliding with it. And so if we had a detector big enough and sensitive enough, even though it doesn't have electric charge and other charges, it has mass. So if it hits the detector, it will make the atoms in the detector vibrate. Okay? That's how we're looking for dark matter right now. Okay? And so we have this thing called, fancy word, cryogenic detectors, which are very low temperature detectors uh, that if the particle dark matter hits it, it will create a certain vibration on, is, I think, is German silicium, the crystal. And you can detect that. Turns out that so far, nothing has made these things vibrate. And, and, and so direct detection is, and so what do you need? You need more, yes, you need more precise detectors, more accurate. And until eventually, you either rule out all possible candidates and then you're in big doo-doo, essentially, and say, OK, what the heck do we do now, right? Or um, the prevalent theory that predicts the existence of particles that could become dark matter are called, or that could be dark matter, is called supersymmetry, which has to do with super strings. And John Schwartz here you know, in the Caltech physics department is one of the architects of this thing. And it turns out, and you know, here I go again, uh, it turns out that Supersymmetry is another idea that has been out for over 40 years, right? And uh, has made all sorts of predictions, including a whole new shadow universe of other particles, right? And, and we should be seeing these particles, now, at least the lightest of all of them, we should be seeing. Maybe. I have a bet. So good. So, what, so, you, so why did he say that? He said that because the machine at CERN, the LHC, is going to double its energy, or it's doubling now. And in 2015, it's going to run at twice as much energy as it did when it found the Higgs. Okay? So the expectation is that, you know, we haven't found supersymmetric particles yet, but when this thing doubles, we'll find them. So I have a bet with a very famous particle physicist called Gordon Kane, who is like Mr. Supersymmetry, you know, that you ain't going to find it. You know? And so we have a bet of a, yeah, we're not going to find this. Um, and he says, of course we will. So we have a, a bet of a good 15-year-old uh, McCallum. Malt. And I think I'm going to win. <laughs> but we don't know. And in the, in the end, you know, nature is the last judge, right? Um, the danger there, and, and it's, I'm glad you said that, because the danger there is the following. And this is, again, going back to the real serious aspect of what I'm talking about, which is if you don't find it. So. What will happen? Sociologically, is a very interesting question. Will people say, you know what? Supersymmetry is dead. It's not going to be found. It hasn't been found. We have expected it. All reasonable models, all reasonable models that predict supersymmetry are ruled out if you don't find it next year. Or you say, hey, doesn't matter. Maybe supersymmetry happens at an energy which is so much higher than we can ever probe that it may be there. We'll never know. And that, epistemologically, like from a philosophical perspective, is what the heck do you do with that, right? I mean, if you cannot test or ever get any knowledge of what's going on, how can you say it's a scientific theory? You know, you say, well, maybe, you know, 200 years from now. But these energies are so high that, so the question then becomes, is a theory that is never going to be able to be shot down. It's a theory that you can never prove wrong, right? That is the thanks. That's the same for the multiverse, right? So the multiverse is the notion that, hey, universe that we have is not the only one. There are lots of out there, all of them, you know, many, many, many different possibilities. Um, 
And it comes from all sorts of interesting motivations. I even wrote papers on the multiverse, so I'm guilty as charged. But the point here is if there is a universe outside our universe, it's outside our light bubble. And now you all know what the light bubble is. And if it's outside of our light bubble, we can't have direct information from it. So you can never verify that there is a multiverse or not a parallel universe out there, but there is a man exploding with a yes and but. Why would he, why wouldn't the other universes uh, have gravitational effects on ours? That's what drives me crazy about them. It seems to me that if there are multiverses around ours, then that could that could explain the gravitational <coughs> effects we can't measure. Oh, okay. That's the, I, no one talks about it. I can't find it online. See the <laughs> no 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 no. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. I know it would be a really cool idea, and the reason it doesn't work is the following. The gravitational forces move at the speed of light, too. And so they will also be outside our light cone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so. I just wanted to ask you, in, in our day and age right now, this type of information is not something that's common to most people talking about, especially in my age group. Sure. There, ignorance is prevalent in this type of knowledge. How, how can people contribute? Because not everyone's going to be a scientist, a physicist, anymore. How can they contribute to this discourse to actually progress and, and, and bring this type of search for, for knowledge, you know, just into the world? Into that's a kill Facebook. That's, that's an awesome question. That's a very good question. And I think there, is, there are several things here. I mean, that's a very important question. And, Clearly, you know, here at Caltech, we have a bunch of very smart kids. They're obviously are the ones that are going to be pushing the envelope of this knowledge in the next few years, right? In fact, there was a student of mine that left um, who is a PhD student here, and she was the valedictorian at Dartmouth. So she's really smart, and she's here. And she's, she's studying quantum information theory, which is this issue of quantum computers, et cetera. But how do we break this out there, right? And and it's very difficult when you're talking about a large scale. Television helps, like Cosmos, Neil deGrasse Tyson, stuff like that. I would hope that, I may offend some of you here, but I would hope that shows like the Big Bang Theory would never exist. <laughs> because hey, it's real funny, you know? I, I love, it's funny, but it creates this image of scientists, a complete idiot, you know, and, and socially inept people. And what young person would aspire to be like that? You know, very few, only the select, you know. And so to me, we have to emulate the role model of scientists and thinkers that really want to create a better future. And, and how do we do that? Well, you have to go to the schools. You have, so the, sci the scientists, I, and I, I, I try to do that as much as I can, we have to get out of our offices and go to the public schools and talk to the kids about what it is that we do. It takes almost no time out of your day, and it makes a huge impact on the children. You know, sixth, sixth graders, eighth graders, they're like all Google-eyed when I show these pictures of the universe and what is a black hole. And, and it doesn't take that long, and you can inspire someone for life. So I think a lot of this passive kind of attitude that we have, we scientists have, is, is one of the factors. You know, that we should be more proactive to change that. And of course, what Michael is doing here is also helpful too. So thank you very much, people. Thank you. Thank you.